Last time, we spoke about the concepts underlying within sample normalization by looking at this RNA sequencing diagram, thereby understanding how length is a factor in order to determine actual relative abundance as strategies such as FPKM and TPM try to do. In this video, we're going to focus in on two specific concepts, the first being fragment length and the second being the relationship between fragment length and our understanding of length in terms of estimating actual relative abundance. And I should say our understanding of gene length in that context. And we'll be examining a lot of these little fragments here, which contain two pieces, the adapter sequences, which are shown in blue and red, and the insert sequences. These are the actual strands of RNA that come from the cells or whatever, wherever the source of the RNA is, whatever, wherever we got it from. This is the stuff we care about, the biological information. And it can always help to look at a more specific diagram of this example. These are some paired end reads. There are adapter sequences and then of course that insert sequence that we care about. Read 1 and read 2, that's what shows that it's paired end because you get information about both sides. There's an inner distance between them. This can be positive, zero, negative, depends on the original size of the insert. And then you have the total fragment length, which is included, includes read one and read two. This fragment length is often what people are discussing when they ask for the mean fragment length, even though the biological information is actually compared, contained within the insert size rather than the fragment length. Now with a paired end read, with paired end reads, it's easy to do a backtracking calculation. Once you have the reads aligned, you can estimate quite precisely what this inner distance is going to be based on looking at where all of the reads ended up and figuring out which ones are the most likely mate pairs, i.e. which read ones likely originated from the same insert fragment, from the same total fragment as read two. And once you have this inner distance, you can add the lengths of read one and read two, which you know because you know how many cycles you ran the sequencer at, and also because all of the reads within the FASTQ file before adapter trimming, before, you know, pre-processing, all of those are the same length. So you know quite precisely what the sizes of read one and read two are. And then if you know your adapter sequence, which you could get from either the sequence, wherever you bought the sequencing prep from, they can tell you the adapter and specifically, you know, to the base pair level, and then you know the size of the adapter, or programs can also estimate the size of the adapter. And with all of that information, you can figure out the total fragment length, and you can figure out mean insert size, mean fragment length, those values that are important within the later steps of analysis. And we'll show why they're important in a little bit. In terms of a single end read though, what happens is you don't get the information from this second read. You don't know exactly what is on the other side of this, uh, you know, of this fragment. And so you have no way of knowing exactly how long the original fragment was, where this, what it, this inner distance is or insert size. You can't know because you don't have information about the other side of the fragment, of the specific fragment you are looking at. And so, as you can see here, we're presented with a dilemma. There is no way really of knowing for a single end read 
what fragment it was sourced from or what the length of the fragment was that it was sourced from. And truthfully, there is no answer to that problem. You'll never be able to look into a FASTQ file, find a read of 150 base pairs and say, aha, that read came from a fragment of 300 base pairs. That specific one came from this specific fragment. It is impossible currently. But you can estimate roughly what the mean fragment length is going to be. So I can say it came from a mean fragment of 300 base pairs, so it was likely somewhere around 300 base pairs, based on biological techniques. Oftentimes, a machine that is manufactured by the company Agilent, the Agilent Bioanalyzer, is utilized in order to calculate a mean effective fragment length. And so you can place a certain amount of RNA after you've you know, undergone the sequencing prep process. You'll get a graph like this. Here in blue are for approximately 150 base pair inserts. And in red, there are the protocol for 600 base pair inserts. The reason why the graphs looked shifted to the right, you know, the 150 base insert might have a, a mean length of a little bit over 300 base pairs is because of certain primer sequences that have been added and adapter sequences, et cetera, et cetera, within this specific kit. I believe the kit is also, this specific graph is from a kit manufactured by Thermo Fisher. But wherever the, whatever company you get the kit from, they're often going to provide either instructions for how to run your own bioanalyzer analysis on your sequence, or they're going to provide a graph with sort of standard reference values that you can look back to in your, if, if the, your program, if an alignment program or whatever asks for the mean fragment length. There are ways computationally of estimating this for single end reads computationally, but it isn't really possible to get a precise estimate without having some biological data on what this mean fragment length may be from a machine like the bioanalyzer. And the bioanalyzer is also very useful. Don't want to sidetrack too much, but it's very useful for detecting perhaps annealing processes or that occur between two non-complementary strands. Annealing processes that occur because the primaries are complementary, but the actual sequences, the insert sequences, aren't. And this can be seen in this kind of graph where you can get secondary artifact peaks that were from the overamplified bubbles from these non-complementary sequences that aren't going to stick together because, as you can probably tell, they aren't complementary, so they aren't as attracted to one another. This is all to say that Agilent, an Agilent bioanalyzer, when you're doing an RNA sequencing experiment, can be very useful in determining both this mean fragment length and in performing quality control on your sample, on the RNA within your sample. And you get some biological information about that RNA that is sort of separate and more holistic from what you get from the actual sequencing experiment. So I promised to explain how this mean fragment length is actually important within the context of our understanding of length in terms of real abundances. There's a concept known as the effective length, often symbolized as such, which is calculated as the length of a gene, Li, minus the mean fragment length plus one. So this is the length of a gene. I'll just make up an example gene, gene A, 
A C T G A C T G A C T. That's gene A, and it has a length of 11. I'm also going to tell you, because it, you know you could draw the graph, you could run the experiment, you could figure it out. At the end of the day, you're going to get a number for the mean effective fragment length, which is five. And I'm also going to assume that this mean fragment length distribution, I'm not going to sort of assume that adapters are a part of this. Usually, you know, you would subtract out the adapters and then utilize the actual mean insert length in this calculation. But I'm going to assume that the adapters have already been subtracted out. Now what this effective length represents, this Li, is, with the squiggly on top, this represents how many potential starting points you have. How many potential starting points within the strand. And why is it important to know this? Well, if in the fragmentation process it is unlikely that you would get a strand after you've reached a certain limit. After, once you've reached sort of the mean fragment length, it is unlikely that you will get a, a strand smaller. Yes, you know, there's a lot of strands that are smaller, but it is more and more unlikely as you get to a smaller and smaller strand size. So if you look at a strand, let's say that gene A was a whole fragment, just existed as a whole fragment, or sorry, gene A exists as, you know, as it does within the, with, as an mRNA within the cell, and we've lysed it and now we're fragmenting it. It is unlikely for example, that it will start at A here and you will just get a fragment ACT because the mean fragment length is five. It's more likely to create a fragment length that's around five rather than create a fragment length around three. So we will assume that there are the potential starting sites are only starting sites that would produce a mean fragment length of five. So this is a potential starting site because you would be able to create a fragment length of five with the first five characters. You could, this would be a potential starting site because you could again create a fragment with five. This would be a potential starting site because you could create a fragment with five nucleotides and so on and so on. And so you would get a total of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven potential starting sites for this gene that is of length 11. You have seven potential starting sites for the fragments, assuming that the fragments have a mean length of five. And so this effective length would thereby be equal to, if we use the formula for the calculation, 11 minus five plus one, which is six plus one, which is seven. And so here we see that the calculation we just did agrees with our visual analysis of the potential starting sites given this mean fragment length. And therefore the effective length is actually seven as opposed to 11. And when we think about how we should sort of scale the various fragments and the various fragment abundances, the count abundances, we should actually use this seven to compare against all of the other effective lengths as opposed to the 11, because there aren't really 11 different ways to produce a fragment from this gene. There's only seven. And so very long genes, right, they will have effective lengths that are closer to their real length than a short gene might. And so a short gene is a little bit at a disadvantage in this regard because it has far, far fewer potential starting sites given a mean effective fragment length of 300 or so. 
So this becomes very important when you're trying to compare between a short length gene and a very long length gene and helps to get closer at what that specific transcript abundance, what the relative, actual relative abundance of the transcript of the gene is going to be within the cell. Next time, we're going to look at how this mean effective fragment length is actually utilized within the calculations of different normalization techniques and counting techniques. Thank you very much for listening.